Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions and order as usual to get as many people in as possible. Short and succinct questions and answers to match would be a great bonus of the day. The first portfolio is transport, infrastructure and connectivity and can remind members that questions two and five are grouped together. I'll take the supplementaries in these first and then anyone who wants to put a supplementary to either of these must come after questions two and five. Question one, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role public transport has in ensuring a green economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, public transport has a vital role in supporting the national transport strategy and taking climate action as part of our green recovery. That is why this Government has approved net additional spending of £487 million in a range of measures to support the sector through the pandemic. Additionally, we have published our Rail Decarbonisation Plan in July and have a long-term commitment to investing £500 million to improve bus priority infrastructure. Our work with the Scottish National Investment Bank is exploring ways to accelerate the deployment of zero-emission buses, making Scotland a global destination for green investment. David Torrance. I thank Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As we continue to progress through the recovery from the pandemic, what action can the Scottish Government take to provide reassurance to commuters to help restore confidence and encourage a safe return to use of public transport? Cabinet Secretary. Uptown Officer, the Transport Transition Plan outlines the activity we are taking to support the sector's transition out of the COVID-19 crisis in line with the Scottish Government's COVID-19 route map. It is a continuously evolving plan and ensures people can travel uh, with confidence while continuing to suppress the virus. Uh, we have implemented measures such as mandatory face coverings on public transport, which we can see from the support we have from the public that this is widely supported by their use on public transport. As I also mentioned, we are supporting the sector uh, with up to £487 million to date to ensure that services keep running whilst physical distancing is advised. And we've also committed an additional £10 million for bus priority during the transition period to ensure that public transport remains an attractive choice. Question two, Keith Brown. To ask the Scottish Government how the recently announced £63 million fund for the bus sector will help to support bus operators with maintaining and increasing services. Cabinet Secretary. Our commitment to providing funding for bus operators of up to £63 million will keep Scotland moving during the COVID-19 crisis. This funding is on top of £46.7 million that we made available from June. People all over the country rely on bus services for work, education, health services and to see family and friends. This funding will support those people to provide them uh, with the bus services they need and capacity to travel safely with physical distancing in place. I'll continue to do what I can to support the bus industry and public transport network. Keith Brown. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? Uh, I'm also aware, though, that from next month, Stagecoach East are intending to axe the number 23 service, which runs through my constituency and crucially impacts on my constituents in more rural areas who rely on this service to access health services, education, work and family. I have written to Stagecoach drawing their attention to this additional funding and asking them to reconsider their decision. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to work with Stagecoach East to find out whether this fund or indeed any other supports are available which could save this service? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, as I mentioned in my response, we are providing over £100 million to support the bus operators across the country, including uh, companies such as uh, Stagecoach, to allow them to ramp up services to almost 100% of pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh, even, of course, with the support uh, of, for this level of service, uh, alongside physical distancing, uh, clearly bus operators will look at their existing network in order to devise that in a way which they, be they believe best serves the local community and which they can provide as an operator. What I can uh, say to the member that it's for a uh, stagecoach to consult with the local authority and local transport partners before uh, making any changes to uh, services and also to, of course, notify the traffic commissioner of 
any changes uh, that they intend to take uh, forward. However, I would certainly want to encourage state, Stagecoach and other local, uh, uh, other local stakeholders to make sure they remain engaged, given the concern that Mr Brown has raised about this service, in order to try and identify a way in which uh, the concerns of the local community can be addressed. Question 5, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what conditions it has set through its financial support for bus operators to keep services viable through the pandemic and as Scotland comes out of lockdown. Cabinet Secretary. In return for our funding, bus operators are required to provide specific, uh, specified levels of service, approaching 100% of pre-COVID levels. We are asking operators to adapt their services to meet current patterns of demand so as to minimise overcrowding and underutilisation. Operators are required to keep services under review in consultation with local transport authorities and health boards. This includes responding positively and quickly to reasonable requests to amend services, such as services which help school travel. Operators must also take reasonable steps to keep passengers at the required physical distance and to follow health guidance. Sarah can I welcome the initiative and say we need to get the maximum benefits and political direction from this investment? Um, is there a requirement to make sure there are no fares increases to keep um, buses affordable? And can the Cabinet Secretary say when the power is to give local authorities the power to run bus services in last year's Transport Act will be in place to make sure we get that real direction going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the purpose of the funding is to fill the gap that is created through the loss of revenue as a result of uh, physical distancing. It's not in relation to fare rates itself, uh, so that would be a matter uh, which would be for the operator uh, directly. In relation to the second point raised by Ms Boyack in relation to the provisions within the Transport Act for a uh, different range of models uh, in operating bus services, as I'm sure the member will appreciate, uh, uh, officials within Transport Scotland have been largely focused on uh, taking forward the challenges which we face through COVID-19, which has resulted in a range of work having to be uh, delayed, including some of the provisions within the Transport Act. As uh, officials are able to move into taking forward aspects of the Transport Act for implementation, uh, they will be able to start moving on the points raised by uh, Sarah Boyack in relation to bus. But this is largely, uh, any delay around this is largely a result of staff having to be deployed to deal with the pandemic. Brief supplementary, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary say this fund uh, should be used to uh, have 100% of pre-COVID levels. First Glasgow have recently axed part of the 31 service, which went into East Kilbride. It now doesn't go into East Kilbride. And when I asked them about this fund, they said uh, they would use it on the existing part of the route. Surely that's not the intention. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, uh, clearly, uh, sh I should welcome the member to his, uh, his post, uh, uh, and given he was appointed last week. It's my first opportunity in which to uh, do so. However, the member, um, I think, uh, misunderstands the way in which this fund operates. It is there to fill the gap in the loss that they have as a result of physical distancing due to limited capacity, uh, and also to make sure that they are prioritising key routes where there may be capacity constraints due to demand for services particularly to hospitals and to schools and to other places of work. The other requirements that they have to meet in order to access this fund, I'm not familiar with this service specifically itself, but given that they also have to consult with the local transport authority and also to refer anything that they seek to change with the service to the traffic commissioner, then clearly it's a matter that can be considered at a local level. Question three, Sandra White. I'll come back to you, Ms. White. I'll just come back to you. Don't worry, I'll come back to you. I'll, I'll go into four and I'll come back to you when you get your car sorted out. Question four is Emma Harper. Is she there? Oh. Yes, President I'm Officer, officer. I am here. Okay, thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the South West Scotland Transport Study. Uh, the South West Scotland Transport Study was concluded in January. It recommended interventions be taken forward for further detailed appraisal in the second strategic transport projects review. Transport Scotland has been working on the COVID-19 transport response in recent months. Therefore, we now intend to take a phased approach to STPR2, 
with phase one reporting in the original planned timescale. Uh, this will focus on uh, the benefit. This will focus on recommendations which lock in, in transport terms, the benefits and travel behaviours of individuals and provide a step change in investment which supports the priorities and the outcomes of the National Transport Strategy. We currently envisage that phase two, which will be complete, which will complete the review, will report later in 2021. Emma Harper, with a brief supplementary after that from Colin Smith. Um, recently, Cabinet Secretary, I wrote to the Prime Minister and the Scottish Secretary to make a case for the UK government transferring money to the Scottish government to pay for much needed upgrades on the A75 Euro route and the 77, which connect to Cairn Ryan. And both roads need, uh, might see increased traffic due to Brexit. So my rationale was to apply the no detriment clause to the Scottish Government, which is in the EU withdrawal agreement. So in addition to the Welcome South Scotland Transport Study, can the Cabinet Secretary therefore commit to exploring all avenues with the UK Government to ensure that the A75 and A77 receives much needed investment to improve safety and journey times? Cabinet Secretary. So, officer, I fully recognise the importance of the A75 and the A77 can play in, post -Brexit, in the post-Brexit world. Uh, the South West uh, Scotland Transport Study includes amongst its recommendations the options of partial duelling and targeted improvements for both the A75 and A77 that will now be subject to more detailed appraisal as part of the second strategic transport project review. Uh, whilst we need to uh, wait the final outcome from the review, uh, that will provide us with a, an opportunity once complete uh, to consider which actions in relation to the A75 and A77 will be taken forward. In relation to funding that's been raised by uh, Ms Harper, uh, what I can say uh, to the member, uh, as was outlined by the First Minister at question time today, that the financial constraints within which the Scottish Government has to operate limit our options when it comes to major capital investment programmes of this nature. And with greater borrowing powers, this Parliament and therefore the Scottish Government would be in a position where it could take strategic decisions around capital investments in projects such as upgrading the A75 and A77 more effectively if we had that financial flexibility to do so. Brief supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, but does the Cabinet Secretary not accept it? Over the last 12 years, £10.5 billion of investment in road infrastructure has been made by this government, but just 0.04 per cent has been in South West Scotland. So when we do eventually see the Strategic Transport Project Review published, will he make sure that that unfairness is addressed and we do see investment in A75 and A77? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, I do not accept the premise of uh, the member's point in terms of the unfairness because there has been significant investment made in the south west of Scotland in terms of transport infrastructure um, over recent years. And I can assure him that this government will remain committed to investing in the south west of Scotland and its transport infrastructure. Question three, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit further funding to expand the provision of broadband services in Glasgow, Kelvin constituency and elsewhere in Scotland. Minister Paul Hillhouse. Uh, latest Think Broadband figures show that as of today, 98.7% of premises across the Glasgow City Council area are now capable of accessing superfast broadband speeds. Uh, commercial build has played an important role in improving broadband connectivity across the, the Glasgow Kelvin area, and I welcome further plans by telecoms operators that will extend that coverage further. For example, City Fibre recently announced they would invest over £100 million in their full fibre plans for Glasgow, while Virgin Media announced an upgrade in service across the city to their new Gig One product, delivering speeds of one gigabit per second. Sandra White. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that update. Uh, I think it's uh, very important the lockdown has shown us that uh, how important broadband can be. In fact, in my constituency, Glasgow, uh, Golden Generation has been given iPads and trying to get people connected, older people connected to the internet uh, across Glasgow. And it's been very, very positive for them. I just wonder, uh, Minister, um, given the importance of keeping people connected, how will the Scottish Government make sure there are not businesses, homes and communities left behind, and what help is it getting from the UK government to reach 100% superfast broadband? Minister. 
Uh, well, thank um, uh, Sandra White for a very important point she raises. I think on the, the point around making sure that people have access to uh, digital connectivity as individuals, uh, I would highlight that um, uh, we, this week we had the £15 million funding for Phase 2 of Connecting Scotland initiative announced uh, by the Community Secretary. And by next April, Connecting Scotland will have provided over 30,000 additional households with devices, data, skills and technical support. But she's also right to identify the need for the infrastructure to be there in the, in, in the first place, of course, to enable that connectivity. And that is a key issue that uh, we are taking forward. Um, clearly, I've referenced the commercial investment, but just to make clear for Ms White and others who have an interest in Glasgow, that uh, we announced this week our Scottish Broadband Voucher Scheme, uh, which will uh, work as part of our commitment to provide access to superfast broadband for every home and business across Scotland. Uh, properties in Glasgow will be eligible for that if they are not being covered by commercial investment. So uh, I would highlight to Ms White that they would potentially benefit from up to £5,000 per premises uh, to enable a, a solution for those properties. And if they haven't had information uh, by July, those who are in the commercial group uh, or indeed uh, get, get information, don't have information by July of next year, will also be able to take advantage of the, the interim voucher scheme if they know they're in a commercial area but haven't yet had clarity about when that's going to be delivered. Uh, we will enable them to have a service by the end of 2021. Now, I've got five minutes and three more questions, but I'd like to get them in, so let's be snappy. Question six, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with the introduction of road equivalent tariff on ferry routes across the Pentland Firth and whether it, it will confirm the date that it will be introduced. Minister. Uh, Transport Scotland and Circle Northlink have been focused on ensuring lifeline connections to the islands continue to operate during the COVID pandemic, which has meant other work, including on RET, has had to be paused. However, since the 1st of January 2020, islanders travelling on the Aberdeen Kirkwall Larwick routes have received a 20% reduction in cabin fares and a three year freeze on passenger non commercial vehicle and cabin fares. Uh, this package of measures builds on the 30% discount already enjoyed by islanders. Further work on fares to establish an agreed mechanism uh, for delivering RET for Orkney and Shetland will be carried out in due course. Brief supplementary, please, uh, Liam MacArthur. It's been 12, thank you, Deputy President. Officer, it's now 12 years since cheaper fares were introduced on Western Isles routes. It's over two years since RET was supposed to be introduced a decade late on Northern Isles routes. The courts and European Commission seem clear it can be introduced. So when can we expect to see cheaper fares on Pentland First routes? And will the Minister commit to using the underspend from the delayed introduction of RET to reduce fares on Orkney's lifeline internal services? Minister. As, as the member may be aware, there's, there's two things that he's, he's mentioned there. Internal ferry services uh, are obviously an area we've had ongoing engagement with myself and Mr MacArthur and indeed Orkney Islands Council. And we uh, have encouraged Orkney Islands Council, given their financial difficulties they face at present, uh, to, uh, to contact local government colleagues around the wider financial position of local authorities in response to COVID-19. But on the issue about RET um, itself, on the Pentland Firth route, we have had a, a letter from the Commission in July of last year uh, giving us uh, their initial findings but it's an unofficial uh, statement from the Commission we've had further engagement with the Commission thereafter on potential options for looking at RET and we'll con continue to keep the member informed on that uh, as we go forward uh, that work has been paused because of COVID-19 but uh, a given undertaking to the member that we will pick up the pick up the ball and, and try and uh, see what progress we can make on that but he will appreciate the financial position this year uh, of our ferry operators across all networks private and public has been very challenging and we've had to focus resources on uh, uh, dealing with the problems in front of us at this moment in time. Question 7, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of people having been discouraged from using public transport in recent months, how it plans to encourage the use of trains and buses once again. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, bus and rail network has seen passengers increase as we move through the stages of the recovery. Uh, customer messaging aligned to Scottish Government guidance continues to encourage uh, travel behaviour to manage demand across the network, not discourage uh, the use of public transport. In addition, this week we announced our Schools and Community Transport COVID-19 Mitigation Fund, uh, which will support measures by transport operators that will increase capacity and public confidence for those using school transport. We remain committed to our National Transport Strategy vision for a sustainable, inclusive, safe and accessible transport system for Scotland. Brief supplementary, please. Thank you. The lockdown seems to have led to a reduction in both traffic congestion and emissions, which is obviously good, and an increase in cycling. 
But I do think there is a lack of public confidence. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary considers that we can maintain such improvements going forward, or is increased car travel inevitable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, we very much welcome the positive behaviour changes. However, uh, there is a, a global uncertainty as to whether temporary changes uh, in travel demand will be sustained or whether behaviour will revert back to pre-pandemic conditions. Uh, that is why we are taking action now during the pandemic uh, to aim to capitalise on the positive travel behaviours that we have seen in recent months by investing in measures such as the uh, £39 million pounds, uh, to deliver the Spaces for People Fund uh, and also the £10 million pounds for pop-up bus priority infrastructure. And we'll continue to take action uh, as we set out our future investment plan uh, in the programme for government and our infrastructure investment plan alongside our st second strategic transport projects review. I'm going to take a question, but it must be very brief. Uh, Mark Ruskell. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Stagecoach about proposed bus service changes. Cabinet Secretary. On the 7th of August, I announced that we will provide bus operators, including Stagecoach, with up to £63 million to increase their bus services. Uh, that funding is in addition to some £46.7 million that I've committed since June. As part of this funding, we have discussed overall service requirements with bus operators, including Stagecoach. Mark Ruskell. 23 service looks set to be reinstated along half of its route by first bus but it is typical of a number of threatened services which cut across multiple council boundaries in Scotland. What strategic role can the government play to ensure that these cross-boundary services are supported? Cabinet Secretary. Raised by the local constituency member Keith Brown in terms of the concern that his local constituents have around proposed changes to the specific service the member referred to by uh, Stagecoach. As outlined at that point, there is a process which the uh, operator must go through, which is through the Regional Transport uh, Authority, which they must engage with and to also consult with the local community on any proposed changes. Uh, following that, any further consideration to a service change is a matter for uh, the Traffic Commissioner. And I would encourage the member, as a regional uh, member, to engage in that process and to make representations to the appropriate authority. Thank you. Without drawing breath, I'm going to move straight on to Justice and Law Officers. Question, question one, Ruth McGuire. Oh, before I do that, questions two and three are grouped together. Question one, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take in light of NSPCC highlighting Police Scotland data showing that recorded sexual offences against children have increased by 30% in the last five years. Cabinet Secretary. Child sexual abuse is an abhorrent crime. Uh, to tackle it, we require a coordinated multi-agency trauma-informed response, in particular to address the devastating impact it has on survivors and victims. We have, over the last four years, focused enormous effort on tackling child sexual exploitation through our national action plan, and we're building on this work by ensuring child abuse is a key focus in work being undertaken across health, justice, equality and human rights. Uh, we've strengthened legislation, we've increased funding to make it easier for victims and survivors to come forward and speak out against abusers. Uh, we continue uh, our significant funding commitments uh, to third sector partners such as NSPCC, Bernardo Scotland, Stop It Now Scotland, as well as funding support programmes of work such as Equally Safe and the Child Protection Improvement Programme to strengthen our response to child abuse. Ruth McGuire. Some of the spike in sexual offences will be online child sexual abuse. Given that some of the measures put in place to deal with the pandemic potentially increased children's vulnerability online, does the Justice Secretary agree with me that there should be no further delay to Scottish Government child protection guidance so that all those working with children and families to prevent and address abuse have the best possible tools available to them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I do agree. It's a very important point that uh, Ruth McGuire uh, raises. Uh, she'll be aware of a multiple, uh, multiple campaigns uh, during lockdown specifically targeting uh, this particular uh, area, uh, some from Police Scotland, others from the Scottish Government and, and from third sector uh, partners. We know that young people inevitably had to spend more time online for learning, socialising over the last few months, uh, but there's a recognition that with that comes uh, increased risks. Uh, she's right, we paused the consultation on, on the revised national guidance for child protection at the beginning of lockdown uh, in acknowledgement of the additional pressures. and We recognise the value of robust guidance uh, to support those working with children and families during the, during the pandemic. Uh, and we've worked closely with representatives of the children's sector throughout. But I take uh, exactly what she says uh, on, on, on board, and I'm more than happy to update her 
uh, in relation uh, to that guidance, but it's a point that I uh, agree with wholeheartedly. And can I remind uh, members and everyone that if we can have succinct questions and answers, we get through them. Question two, Bill Bowman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the issues concerning the Hate Crime in Public Order Scotland Bill that have been raised by bodies such as the Law Society of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Hate crime has a hugely damaging uh, impact and effect on victims, their families, their communities. Uh, the recent increase in hate crime charges reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is a clear indication that hate crime remains a significant problem. The increase in hate crime charges may reflect a greater willingness of victims and witnesses to report. However, we're not complacent and recognise that not all incidents of hate crime come to the attention of the police. Uh, we remain committed to tackling all forms of hate crime and prejudice whenever and wherever they arise. The Bill affirms that commitment by ensuring sufficient protection is provided for those that need it. Uh, since the Bill's introduction, I've engaged extensively with a range of organisations, including the Law Society of Scotland. I'm aware of the strong views that have been expressed on the Bill, and I'm listening to the feedback it has received. I note in particular concerns over the Bill's stirring up hatred offences. I'll reflect on whether there needs to be changes made and how these could be done in an appropriate and effective way. In the coming months, the bill will be robustly scrutinised by the Justice Committee and MSPs, and I will give their conclusions my full consideration to make sure this legislation can be a force for good in helping protect groups affected by dangerous hatred and prejudice, while, of course, protecting vital freedoms that we all hold dear. Bill Bowman. Just the Secretary for his answer, and I agree with what he says about um, hate speech. But the Hate Crime and Public Order Bill has been criticised for threatening freedom of speech by the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Police Federation and the Law Society of Scotland, amongst others. Yet the Justice Secretary only said that he would reflect on, to use his own words, the provisions in the Bill after, yes, activists and writers voiced their concerns about the Bill. Can one imply, therefore, that the Justice Secretary only listens to concerns about legislation when raised by nationalists? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that is a really uh, woeful response. Uh, I wish Bill Bowman could have risen to the occasion uh, of, of the question. In fact, actually, when his own justice spokesperson, Liam Kerr, or indeed Murdo Fraser, I don't think he's in the chamber, I personally phoned Murdo Fraser to speak to him about his concerns uh, on the hate crime bill. I've engaged with Liam Kerr uh, in relation to this bill in advance of the introduction of this bill. And I've said I will listen to opposition. I've said that very clearly, very publicly, that I would listen to opposition uh, stakeholders and members of this parliament. If we are to do this subject justice, and I'm certain of Bill Bowman's good intentions around this, if we are to do this subject justice, then it would be helpful if we attempted to take the politics out of the issue and look at the substance of the issue, because all of us are in agreement, regardless of those who criticise the bill, and I think have very genuine concerns about the bill, we all have a responsibility to those groups who have often been the victims of hatred to make sure that this bill is effective in protecting them, while, of course, as I say, uh, protects the freedoms that we all hold so dearly. Question three, Anna Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to engage communities across Scotland as the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill progresses. Cabinet Secretary. Following recommendations made by Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation in, the Scottish, uh, in Scotland, the Scottish Government engaged extensively with stakeholders. Uh, in, in 2018, the Scottish Government launched the One Scotland Hate Has No Home Here in November. Uh, 2018, we ran 11 public awareness events throughout Scotland. A series of stakeholder engagements and bilateral uh, meetings have also been undertaken. Uh, since the Bill's introduction itself, we've engaged with more than 45 organisations. I've met with a number uh, of those stakeholders and organisations from faith groups, equality groups, legal experts and victim groups. As the Bill makes its passage, through the Parliament, I will, I will ensure to engage with these stakeholders. Uh, this includes those that represent communities directly affected uh, by hate crime, but also those, as I've already said, who oppose the bill. I think it will be essential to make sure that all those voices that, are, that, are, that, 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 that have an opinion on this bill uh, are listened to, and I have committed to ensure I do that. Anna Sarwar. The Justice Secretary and I recognise the importance of challenging hate crime and defeating prejudice and hatred. Sadly, for us and many others, it is often a daily experience. I know we both share the same ambition and want the same outcome to make Scotland a fairer and more equal country where everyone has the same opportunity regardless of their race or religion. There are lots of good things in the bill, consolidating aggravation, adding vulnerability in sex and removing outdated blasphemy laws. But does he accept that how aspects of the bill are currently drafted and the narrative that now built around the bill risks undermining the very purpose of the bill itself and risks fracturing the coalition we need to build across Scotland to defeat hate? 
Cabinet Secretary, if we could ask briefly, because we're really pressed for time. Well, I, I don't think Anas Harwar's uh, uh, characterisation of the bill is incorrect. I think there is uh, challenges around the narrative. Um, I think that's why it's important as legislators we all engage uh, with those who oppose the bill, but also we crucially listen to the voices that are impacted by hatred. Uh, Anna Sawar uh, has been at the forefront of tackling hatred in, in, in many of its forms, uh, and he will know that it's important that we listen to those voices directly impacted. So, yes, I think from, from my perspective uh, as, the, as, as the Cabinet Secretary who will lead this bill through its Parliament, I will engage, I will listen, I will find that common ground where I can. And my only plea to those who have stood in opposition to the bill is to ask you to do the same, to listen to those who are directly impacted by hate crime and ask yourself, why do organisations like the Equality uh, Network, why do Stonewall, uh, Skojek, Muslim Council for Scotland and many other groups support the bill, including the stirring up offences? Four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government on what date it plans to implement the disclosure provisions under the Management of Offenders Scotland Act 2019. Cabinet Secretary. The changes to basic disclosure in the 2019 Act require operational changes to the system of disclosure certificates issued by uh, Disclosure Scotland. Uh, disclosure Scotland activated their business continuity plan in light of COVID-19. Uh, disclosure Scotland and the Scottish Government have been working together to set a new implementation date. I will imminently be announcing a date for implementation when the necessary secondary legislation has been laid in Parliament and the guidance has been published. I will write to the member when that happens, as I say, imminently, with confirmation of the date of implementation. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I appreciate we have seen a disruption in recent months, but it's over a year since this bill received royal assent and one of its most important provisions has not been implemented. These delays are continuing and people with minor convictions on their records from several years ago are losing out on job opportunities as a result, despite the fact this Parliament agreed it should no longer be the case. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, if, at least today, guarantee that these changes will be in place by the end of the year, a full 18 months after they were agreed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, after, uh, as I've said, I will announce an implementation date uh, imminently and I'll make sure the member is kept up to date. What I would say uh, is, of course, these changes were always going to take some time. Of course, uh, if I take out the COVID disruption, they were always going to take uh, some time. That was because um, they required some significant IT uh, changes. And I can write to the member uh, in the interest of brevity around some of those IT changes that were required. And I would remind uh, the member uh, that when similar changes were made to disclosure law in England and Wales, uh, there was a two year period between legislation and implementation. The reason for that, I imagine, very much similar to ours, the IT systems needed updating. But I, I will announce the date uh, for uh, implementation imminently and I'll ensure the member is kept up to date. I have nine minutes and four questions, so please speed up. Number five, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it's responding to the increase in domestic abuse reports in 2020. Cabinet Secretary. The, the impact of COVID-19 has highlighted the risks to women and children experiencing domestic abuse. It remains very much our priority that victims get the support they need and are kept safe from harm. We provided additional significant funding to the third sector to support organisations, including 1.35 million to Scottish Women's Aid. I can assure uh, the Member and Parliament we're in close discussions with Police Scotland, who remain committed to tackling domestic abuse and, as I say, third sector partners. And I recently met with victim support organisations uh, from the Victims task, Port, task Force to discuss this very issue. And finally, uh, I would say to, to Ms uh, Martin that this is a, a cross-government uh, interest. And I know that, the, uh, that my colleague, uh, Ms McKelvey, is having similar discussions to ensure that vital frontline services continue to be fully accessible to victims during these unprecedented times. Julie Martin. The Cabinet Secretary for that, and he refers to the abuse of children, which is my supplementary question to that. Um, no one wants another lockdown, but we must prepare for one in the winter, potentially. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what's been put in place for the partners and children of abusers to assist them now and in any situations where we have to lock down again? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Gillian Martin makes a very important point uh, indeed. Uh, th this is part of the discussions that we're having uh, in government, but also uh, is a discussion that I will take up uh, personally with Scottish Women's Aid. I'm certain my officials uh, are having those discussions. Uh, it's really important for us to understand the needs of women and children in particular uh, if we are to go into another lockdown or indeed if in uh, geographies, as, as we have seen in Aberdeen City, uh, restrictions are reimposed uh, once uh, again. So we work closely with third sector partners, with Police Scotland on these matters uh, to raise awareness in the services available and encourage those who are experiencing this 
uh, pernicious crime uh, to, to seek support uh, without delay. And I think that message from the Chief Constable, from myself as Justice Secretary, uh, often from the First Minister herself at our daily briefings, of regardless of whether we're in lockdown or out with, if you feel you are in danger, uh, you must call 999. And regardless of the pressures that are on Police Scotland, they will always take a zero tolerance approach to domestic abuse. And I think that message is one that needs to continue, uh, regardless of, as I say, whether we are under lockdown uh, or out with. Question six, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what recent assessment it has made of the prison estate and whether it is fit for purpose. Cabinet Secretary. Since 2002, the Scottish Prison Service has been implementing a 20-year estate development programme in response to review of the prison estate by the Scottish Government. To date, 75% of the prison estate has either been replaced or modernised, thus evidencing our continuous commitment to improvement uh, in this area. Uh, she'll also know that there was an uplift uh, in the capital budget uh, in 1920 uh, for the Scottish Prison Service. Uh, work is ongoing for the construction of the new National Women's Facility to replace Corton Vale, uh, and work on the two women's uh, community custody units uh, will recommence uh, during September uh, of uh, this year. Uh, approval has also been given to progress uh, with HMP Highland and HMP Glasgow towards invitation to tender stage. Margaret Mitchell, briefly. The full HMIPS inspection report into HMP Dumfries was published in July. It states the prison lacks accessible cells for prisoners with disabilities, with only one cell in the prison which was occupied, able to accommodate wheelchair use. The most pressing priority for the capital investment in SPS is the lack of accessible cells for disabled, uh, disa disabled prisoners. And even where a prisoner's disability was well known, records show a lack of checks for reasonable adjustment for records in need, uh, for prisoners in need of them. Cabinet Secretary, this is a problem across the prison. Question, please. Not only unacceptable, but a time bomb waiting to happen in terms of the potential consequences for a breach of disabled prisoners' fundamental rights. Will you therefore confirm if an equality impact assessment of the SPS estate has been carried out and the action the Scottish Government is taking to address this issue? I need to find a way dealing with these remote so, long questions. Cabinet Secretary. So on, on, on operational matters for SPS, I'd encourage uh, Margaret Mitchell to get in contact directly with SPS. Uh, on those uh, issues. What I would say about HMP Dumfries, and I think I may have just signed off a, a parliamentary question to her colleague Oliver Mundell on this very question, uh, there is some recent investment that has gone into HMP uh, and there is planned for HMP uh, Dumfries. Uh, I will check whether that investment uh, is, is related to accessibility. Uh, she makes a good point, or much of our prison estate uh, is Victorian uh, in nature, and therefore the replacement programme of our prisons is focusing on those prisons uh, that are older and uh, they will be replaced by prisons uh, that have those uh, accessible facilities uh, very much as a priority. Question seven, Joan McAlpine. Uh, she's on mute. On strong UK government. Following the Justice Secretary's calls for an urgent Four Nation ministerial meeting on fisheries and maritime security. I take you got the question, Minister. Well, I have the question, obviously, That's in advance, fine. Okay. So, <laughs> which is helpful uh, when it comes to broadband issues. Um, I only have this question in advance. Uh, I've received a reply from the Secretary of State for Transport agreeing that a meeting would be useful, but we are still waiting for a date to be agreed. Uh, I, however, remain concerned that we've been excluded from a key decision-making forum, despite the fact that the Scottish zone covers 62% of the UK's domestic EEZ. Uh, police Scotland are responsible for by far the largest coastline of any UK police force and many key issues such as fisheries protection are devolved. While I welcome the Transport Secretary's positive response, uh, I remain unconvinced that this is much more than a box ticking exercise. This must be brief, Ms McAlpine. Thank you. Scotland's waters cover 62% of the UK's domestic exclusive economic zone, and many functions relating to maritime security are devolved, including fisheries protection. Does the Justice Secretary therefore agree that this is yet another example of UK ministers seeking to undermine devolution and respect for devolved competencies? 
make this a brief answer if you well, like. I hear, I hear the Conservatives groaning, but actually they should be standing up for Scotland's interests. That is what they are in this Parliament to do. So it is deeply concerning. These matters do involve devolved matters. They have a direct impact on devolved competencies, as I've already highlighted. So I'm really unclear why UK ministers thought it appropriate to exclude the Scottish Government. But I'm pleased we have a meeting date, and of course I'll keep members updated to see whether that has been a, a, a fruitful and helpful discussion. Mr Halker Johnson, you're relieved, you're guessing in question eight, but must be brief. Delighted to ask the Scottish Government what action Police Scotland is taking in response to littering in popular visitor areas over the summer. Cabinet Secretary. Well, littering is totally unacceptable, and Police Scotland is alert to the issue of littering uh, in our beauty spots. They have powers to issue on-spot fines for littering and fly-tipping, which are criminal offences for which fixed penalties can be issued. Although littering fixed penalties, as I'm sure the member knows, are normally issued by local authorities. Uh, different fine levels apply depending on the offence, uh, as does whether the FPN is being issued by police uh, officers or indeed by a procurator fiscal. The Scottish Government has partnered with Zero Waste Scotland and, we keep, and keep Scotland Beautiful uh, to develop a national anti-littering campaign, which launched on the 15th of July, and we're working with local authorities and Police Scotland on what more can be done to protect our environment and indeed our rural communities in Scotland. Mr Halker Johnson. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary to be aware that communities across the Highlands and Islands have reported increases in littering, many linked to incidents of irresponsible wild camping. I rec recognise that there are a number of public bodies involved in promoting good practice, but ultimately enforcement must form part of combating this problem. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how uh, police are engaging with local communities on the issue and is he confident that they have adequate powers and resources to police rural areas and protect Scotland's natural environment? Cabinet Secretary, well, uh, Jamie, Jamie Halcombe Johnson does raise a very important uh, point. And, and we liked, like uh, people to, to, to holiday in Scotland. We want people to take staycations in Scotland. Uh, we want them to act responsibly. So the onus, of course, first and foremost, is on the individual uh, who is camping uh, or indeed uh, uh, holidaying in Scotland. Uh, what I would say is that I raise this issue with Police Scotland uh, on a regular basis. And the Chief Constable and I, in fact, have spoken about it. Uh, in, 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 in weeks gone by. Uh, certainly it hasn't been raised to me that there's a lack of powers, but I'm happy to re-engage both with Police Scotland and local authorities if they feel that there's a further need for enforcement powers. That's something that the Scottish Government would be open to exploring. Thank you. That ends that batch of uh, this. Uh, point of order, Deputy President Officer, can I ask that the Parliamentary Bureau reflect on how these sessions are run there was no time in that session for supplementaries to be taken on important issues like the hate crime bill and the government's failure to address spent convictions. And I think it's important that front and backbenchers have an opportunity to put their uh, views across. Right. And therefore, I think the Parliamentary Bureau needs to reflect on this to ensure that parliamentary scrutiny is not compromised. Thank you. Thank you very much. The point of standing orders is I had a section for each of these questions. You know my policy. I try to let members who take the trouble to put a question in to get to the question. I do political balancing. I don't really need to explain all this to you. And the running of the portfolio questions is strictly one for me, but we're a strict timetable. This is not a debate. I can see you're perched. Uh, I'm going straight on to Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. No doubt it's been noted what you said about the Bureau. Uh, the final portfolio session where questions two, three, seven and eight our group together. Question one, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the work of NHS preparations for the end of the Brexit transitionary periods. Uh, it's for the Minister, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, the uh, UK government's, uh, well, the UK government's reckless decision uh, not to seek an extension to transition period will compound the damage to our society and the economy done by the pandemic. I can confirm that preparations to try and protect NHS Scotland, and indeed all of our health and social care services and workforce from the impacts of leaving the EU without a deal are continuing. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for his answer. The UK Government has asked drug companies to stockpile at least six weeks supply of medicines to guard against disruption at the end of the transition period. Can the Minister advise whether the Scottish Government has issued similar advice and is he confident that NHS National Services Scotland will be able to establish a sufficient supply or stockpile of medicines to see us through the end of the transition period? 
Minister. The President Officer, the member will recognise that this is not my area of expertise. However, I can tell her that the Scottish Government is working closely with the UK Government and the other devolved administrations to plan for the end of the transition period, including doing all we can to ensure that we have access to medicines in the event of border disruption. Those plans include the UK Government contacting pharmaceutical companies and suppliers regarding increasing the stock holding of medicines, which we know will be more challenging given that we have uh, only just written to companies, the current circumstances and the impact of COVID-19 have all had on the supplies. Of course, a more distant relationship with the European Medicines Agency could cause a potential loss of access to the single European licence for a new medicine with all the difficulties that would create, and that's something that would be in no one's interest. Question two, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether or not it will commit to re-engaging with the UK Government on plans for the UK internal market. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has been engaging with the UK Government on the UK internal market proposals and has suggested a way forward. It is the UK Government that is currently refusing to engage on what is a sensible suggestion. On the 3rd of July, I wrote to Michael Gove in advance of the publication of the paper to make clear that the I raised this at the last meeting of the JMCEN. The Scottish Government published its initial analysis of the White Paper on the 12th of August. And this Parliament rejected the proposals on the 18th of August by 92 votes to 31. Much of Scotland has rejected them too. Despite the short consultation period, organisations from key sectors, business, industry, farming, crofting and the environment, have made clear that these proposals are unacceptable. They're bad for business, jobs and the environment, and risk driving down standards and undermining common frameworks and devolution. The Scottish Government believes that the common frameworks which are being established to manage policy variations on the basis of agreement and in respect of devolution are what is needed to manage the practical regulatory and market implications of the UK leaving the EU um, and are still, we are still fully committed to engaging in their implementation. The ball on that is now firmly in the UK Government's court. Alexander Burnett. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, whilst the Cabinet Secretary track record of engagement or rather lack of it is now well known, uh, does he now have agreed with Scottish business organisations a list of exemptions from a mutual recognition principles uh, and has that list been shared with the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm very interested that Mr Burnett is already retreating from the proposals that the UK Government has made. There is no list of exemptions within the White Paper, nor is anything suggested for them. Uh, and also, I would kindly suggest to Mr. Burnett, he goes back and reads the uh, submissions from organisations, the SCDI, for example, a business organisation, indicating that they were not convinced by the proposals. The best way forward is for the UK government to engage in negotiation. I am happy to negotiate on the basis that the frameworks are the way forward. Question three, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the contribution that the internal market makes to levels of employment in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I, I would not wish, Presiding Officer, to repeat myself, but I have indicated what the engagement is. These proposals were, of course, not shared with the Scottish Government, nor with the Welsh Government, nor with the Northern Ireland Executive on the, when they, before they were published. I ra have raised these concerns with UK ministers. The UK government has offered no indication <clears throat> that it recognises the threat to jobs and prosperity across Scotland that the proposals entail. The UK government wants either a, a low deal or a no deal from the Brexit uh, negotiations. So what we need to do is to engage properly so that we can get a solution to a problem that is being created by the UK government. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? But as he well knows, the UK internal market helps to protect 550,000 Scottish jobs and is responsible for 60% of Scotland trade, which of course is more than the rest of the world combined. So can I ask Mike Russell why he and his government are prepared to put such a significant proportion of the Scottish economy in jeopardy just to push his own party's constitutional grievance? Cabinet Secretary. I could turn the member's question around and ask why he is prepared to put the economy of all of these islands at risk to pursue the, the grievance of Brexit, which is the Tory party has done. But Mr Whittle uh, presumably believes the Tory government when they say that there is no threat to trade with the EU by leaving the EU. Why does he believe there is a threat to trade for Scotland if it has a different constitutional or regulatory arrangement? That is not logical or sensible. Question 7, Oliver Mundell. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason it disengaged from discussions with the UK Government regarding the forthcoming internal market legislation. Cabinet Secretary. As I made clear in the debate on Tuesday, my assessment, which now appears to have been absolutely borne out by events, was that what was taking place was an attempt to undermine devolution. I am absolutely certain that nobody who is an elected member of the Scottish Parliament, or at least I hope that nobody who is an elected member of the Scottish Parliament, would, would want a Scottish Government Minister to go along with the undermining of devolution. Uh, question 8, Fulton McGregor. Did I take your supplementary, Mr Mundell? I didn't. Oh, well, I didn't mean it personally. It's my fault. Please proceed. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, is it not just better to be honest and admit that the Scottish Government doesn't want the UK internal market to work? Yeah. That it's absolutely fixated on keeping Scotland tied to EU regulation that we'll have no say in? And uh, is cherry picking from the submissions because a lot of them recognise that actually the UK internal market is very important to Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I regret that Mr Mandel has uh, imputed my honesty. I, I will not uh, impute his sincerity in what he believes, but he is talking balderdash. Uh, the reality of the situation is that we are endeavouring to try and have a productive, negotiated relationship. It is the UK government that makes that very different, difficult. The previous Secretary of State made it difficult, and the current Secretary of State makes it difficult too. Uh, question 8, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest engagement has been with the UK Government about UK Government proposals for a UK internal market. Cabinet um, as I indicated in the first, uh, as I indicated in the first, uh, a group, uh, first of these group questions, um, we, I wrote to Michael Gove uh, uh, about these matters. I raised them at the Joint Ministerial, com the last Joint Ministerial Committee. Um, uh, we have responded to these proposals very, very clearly in a document published last week. And of course, the uh, Chamber debated these proposals on Tuesday and came to an uh, overwhelming view that they were to be rejected. So we are engaging constructively and we are engaging positively. It is regrettably the UK government that is absolutely refusing to listen. Fulton McGregor. Thanks again, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I realise there's been quite a lot of questions in this grouping, but I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could outline how concerned he is that under these proposals the Scottish Parliament laws could be challenged in court if they were considered to contravene the new UK internal market legislation as agreed by the UK Parliament. Cabinet Secretary. It is absolutely clear that that is the case. And indeed, Lord Callanan responding in the House of Lords to a question, I think, from David Wigley, uh, indicated that he expected the courts to be involved in these matters. We have the prospect of the UK government permitting, for example, a further privatisation of the NHS, and that being forced upon Scotland by means of court action, possibly from, say, American health providers, without us being able to resist it. That was never intended, should not happen, and I would look to every MSP to stand up for the right of the Scottish Parliament to make decisions in its areas of competence, even if you disagree on having any additional powers. Any MSP on any bench who refuses to do so really has to take a long, hard look at themselves and ask if they're in the wrong place. A question for Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the powers that will come to Scotland once the Brexit transition period is concluded. Minister. Um, as Graeme Simpson must know, these powers are already devolved to Scotland. Environmental standards, food safety, animal welfare, all devolved. If food safety is a new power, what has Food Standards Scotland been doing all these years? If environmental regulation is a new power, what does Graeme Simpson think SEPA does all day? What the UK government is actually proposing is a new blanket constraint on devolved powers unilaterally imposed from London, regardless of the views of this parliament. This is in place of an EU system of minimum standards agreed between sovereign and equal member states on the basis of co-decision, subsidiarity and consent. Thank the Minister for that answer. She will be well aware that 111 powers uh, are going to come here. Um, they're, they're in a raft of areas, including regulations for energy efficiency of buildings, air quality and animal welfare. Can I ask the Minister which of these 111 powers is her personal favourite? Minister. Um, 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, different standards have been applied across the UK for many years, with no detriment to businesses or consumers. And as I said in Tuesday's debate, in, mo in more than four years of discussion with the UK Government, not one example has ever been given of where the internal market is at risk from devolution. But what has become clear is that the UK Government's proposals go even further than the powers previously exercised by the EU. So, for example, building standards, where the proposals refer to the alleged problems caused by different building regulations in Scotland and England. Such differences have never been directly caught by EU law. Presiding officer, this parliament voted against these proposals on Tuesday and this government will continue to resist any dilution of devolution. Brief supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Does the minister agree that Tory assertions of additional powers are at best deluded and at worst a deliberate attempt at conning the people of Scotland? And what impact will the removal of powers over state aid have in Scotland, for instance, on saving the jobs of people who work for companies like Ferguson Marine? Minister. <coughs> He is absolutely right. The UK government white paper makes it clear that currently devolved state aid powers would be reserved under these proposals. That is irrefutably a power grab. Reserving these state aid powers would remove a key devolved tool for growing businesses and creating jobs in Scotland, which the Scottish Government cannot support. Question five, Annie Wells. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the Constitution Secretary's comments to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee on the 18th of June, whether it has revisited planning for a second independence referendum. Cabinet Secretary. As the member is aware, on the 18th of March, I wrote to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to confirm that work related to an independence referendum had paused for the time being, as the Scottish Government is focused on responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the member also knows, that pandemic is far from over. The Scottish Government's position remains the same. We will return to the issue uh, when it is appropriate to do so. However, the refusal of the UK government to seek an extension to the transition period, the power grab now underway, and the rejection of reasonable proposals for extending borrowing and improving the fiscal framework as necessitated by the pressures of COVID, all illustrate beyond doubt why independence is required and why the work to achieve it needs to be taken forward with vigour and purpose. It clearly has increasing support from the people of Scotland. Annie Wills. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but I'm also pleased to hear that the Cabinet Secretary has not instructed work to be visited on independence. Because does he agree that securing people's jobs, protecting public health and restoring our schools should remain the utmost focus for this government and commit to continued deprioritisation of government work in Indiref 2? And does he agree with me that independence should not and cannot be this government's number one priority? Cabinet Secretary. What I think the number one priority is to ensure the prosperity, safety and, and productive future for the people of Scotland. That can only lie in independence. It cannot lie in dependence upon the UK, and particularly not upon this hard right government which we are forced to suffer. And also forced to suffer the internal market proposals which are designed to undermine Scotland. I am looking to every member in this chamber to stand up for Scotland. So far it, looks as, it seems as if I look to Annie Wells for that in vain. Question six, Peter Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government if it supports the UK Government's position in Brexit negotiations that the UK should be an independent coastal state so that Scotland's vital fishing industry can be protected. Minister. Presiding officer, Scotland's fishing fleet is a key contributor to the success of our wider seafood industry and coastal communities in the Scottish Government will always champion their interests. That success, however, has also been built on frictionless trade with the EU, close partnerships with neighbouring coastal states and access to vital EU labour and funding, all of which are jeopardised by the UK Government's approach. That's why the Scottish Government continues to support a deal with the EU that protects the interest of the whole seafood supply chain in Scotland and not just individual parts. Uh, before I take your supplementary, Mr Chapman, tedious though it is, uh, the wording is independent coastline, not independent state. Just thought I'd draw that to your attention. And I would ask you now for your supplementary, which of course you can just say what you think as long as it's relevant. I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I did, uh, I did uh, get that uh, wording changed to what I said just now. But anyway, um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, the SNP's policy is to hand back powers over fishing to the EU and rejoin the hated common fisheries policy. Can I ask the Minister what he will say to North East fishermen 
who have campaigned all of their lives to get out of a policy that has decimated their industry as to why the Scottish Government policy is to rejoin it. Minister. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government's clear priority, as we know, is for Scotland to become a member state of the European Union. And until such time as we can rejoin the EU, our preferences for negotiations on access and quota to take place on an annual basis under the coastal states framework and in line with international law. It's also uh, our policy to take account of every aspect of the needs of the fishing sector. And that is completely at odds with the profoundly disingenuous approach to negotiation that's been taken by the e uh, UK government. And it's high time the UK government was honest with the fishing industry and the wider seafood supply chain about the implications of their approach. Either they're going to sell out the fishing industry again yep. by ceding permanent access and fixed quota shares and with no influence over the CFP, or they'll accept new trade barriers that will devastate the competitiveness of Scottish seafood. And I say to Peter Chapman, either would be wrong, wrong, wrong. Thank you very much. And as there has been a, a point of order, it wasn't really a point of order about backbenchers being called, of course, backbenchers were getting called. But if you ask lengthy supplementaries, my colleague will agree with this as she's standing in the wings, and lengthy answers, we cannot get through the question. So we are in your hands a great deal of the time, and we're weary of asking for brief supplementaries and, as far as possible, brief answers, because people are entitled to ask their questions, and we would like to get supplementaries in. Thank you very much. There'll be a pause now while I cool down.